sure the sound's working. Yep. Get past that little skip there. All right. So we're on to the pre-flop stages of uh, more than 60 big blinds. This is going to get pretty in-depth and intense, so uh, feel free to re-watch the VOD as much as you want. Let me mute that, my playback. Put this on so you guys can hear. Here we go. Now let's discuss when you have more than 60 big blinds before the flop. We're going to be discussing many situations, including when everyone folds around to you, when you raise and someone re-raises, when someone limps in front of you, when multiple people limp in front of you, etc. But for now, let's discuss very specifically when you are folded to. This is when all the players who have to act before you just fold. Okay? So, in this situation, we are going to be discussing this assuming you have roughly 75 big blinds. Because when you have more than 60 big blinds, your strategy will change as you get deeper and deeper and deeper stacked. Like if you're playing 300 big blinds deep, you should play differently than when you are, let's say, 75 big blinds deep. But we're going to use 75 big blind charts to sort of encompass the deep stacked portion of tournament poker. And if you do follow the charts I'm about to give you, you will be perfectly fine. We do have an extensive set of charts at pokercoaching.com in the tool section. So make sure you reference those for whatever specific sack size you do have. But if you do just follow these 75 big blind charts I'm about to give you, you will be perfectly fine when you are playing the deep stacked portion of a tournament. So realize that these charts I'm about to give you presume your opponents play well. If your opponents play too tightly, or if they will rarely three bet you before the flop, you should raise wider than these charts because if you're not getting re-raised, it means you get to see the flop and play the hand. If your opponents will very frequently call or three bet you, if they're gonna be applying pressure and putting you in difficult spots and just making you get to the showdown, in that scenario, you should actually raise a little bit tighter than these charts. Also, you will notice that from all positions besides a small blind, you should not open limp. When everyone folds around to you, you should not just call the big blind pretty much ever. You'll also notice no obviously bad cards are played except for perhaps in the very, very late positions and the small blinds. So let's take a look at the default strategy. This was one of my general uh, strategies, so you guys are going to see it now. And since we're focusing on this, I want to reference it really quickly. So I'm going to take a screenshot of this while it's playing. Uh, so I can get these charts without this play button in the middle. When you have about 75 big blinds in your stack. So when everyone folds around to you, well, when you're under the gun, you're going to be first, right? So this is when you're first to act. This is roughly what you should do. You should raise with all these hands in red and fold all the hands in white. Um, you may say, this seems really tight. Or you may say, this is loose, depending on how you naturally play. But this is what the optimal strategy is. You will notice fives, fours, threes, and twos are just folded. That's the mistake I used to make all the time is I would play hands like fives, fours, threes, and twos from early position because, hey, it's a pair. It's got to be good, right? Well, it turns out it's not. It plays very poorly after the flop when you do not make three of a kind. You'll also notice some of these big offsuit Broadway hands. A Broadway card is a card 10 or higher, so a hand like king 10 offsuit is a Broadway hand. It's actually not all that good. It should be folded. Same thing for ace 10 offsuit. Notice all these ace x offsuits are just folded. You'll also notice um, some of these higher suited hands are still played, like queen nine suited, king nine suited. These are perfectly viable hands, even from under the gun first position. You'll notice some of these weaker suited connectors are not quite as good, but if you did want to loosen up a little bit because you don't think you're gonna get three bet very often or you think your opponents are gonna play a little bit too tightly, you should adjust by adding in stuff like ace two suited, jack nine suited, 10 eight suited, nine eight suited, ace seven suited, seven six suited, um, maybe even ace 10, king 10. I'm sorry, ace-10 and king-jack offsuit. So that's how you would widen that under the gun range. Like the never call preflop hands. Yeah, this isn't even talking about calling. This is just talking about opening. So this is when it's folded to you or you're, you're first to act in the hand. It means with no limper, not even a limper. But I would, I would definitely agree with these ranges. The part for me where it gets a little muddled is between uh, cutoff and button uh, because there are, I guess, hijack as well. Like my hijack probably plays like my cutoff. Cutoff plays relatively the same with a couple of add-ons from the button. Um, like maybe hands like jack six suited, jack five suited. Um, 
Um, definitely hands kind of like the 6.5, or, or sorry, 6.4 suited, 8.5 suited, things like that. I'll add into this cutoff because at the, most of the stakes I'm playing, players aren't opening enough from that position and they're folding too much from the button uh, small blind and big blind. The only thing to worry about is that some players know that they're supposed to three bet the button more. So if I start to attempt this and I realize that there's a player on the button uh, that is three betting too much, then obviously I'll just pull it back and the adjustment at the smaller blinds has to be bigger than it does at other stages. So like my typical default was if this is my perfect cutoff default opening range, but there's a player on the button who's going to three bet me at a higher frequency, uh, in other tournaments at higher buy-in levels, I'm going to the hijack opening range, but at the smaller stakes, I'm gonna go to the low jack opening range. Just because it needs to be that much tighter because when players do that, even when they do it too much at the micros, they're still very willing uh, to keep fighting. So I need my hands to be a little bit stronger on average, uh, not a little bit, but literally like 10% stronger on average than I do to counteract that. So then I'll go to a low jack uh, opening range. And it's the kind of thing where once you do this a few thousand times, you get these ranges down. So you don't even have to think about it. You just go, oh, I'm going to low jack. And uh, you just kind of put it in your head. You're like, well, if I was gonna open from the low jack here, what would I open with? Boom, this is it. And now, as you get closer and closer to the button, your range is going to widen a little bit in each position because you have to worry about fewer and fewer players yet to act behind you, waking up with a premium hand. So, you see from under the gun, you get to play about 13.7% of hands. Under the gun plus two, you get to play about 16.3% of hands. And then under the gun plus two, you get to play 19.2% of hands. So you get to play just a little bit wider in each seat. You may see some rather odd things happen in these um, optimal charts. And like, for example, in this under the gun plus two chart, you see nine, eight suited played and seven, six suited played, but not eight, seven suited played. That has to do with the ranges your opponents behind you are supposed to play. But you're gonna find that most people yet to act are just not gonna play optimally as well. So to clarify, that means that the reason why you're not gonna open the eight, seven suited theoretically as much is because players behind you are gonna be more likely to be opening the ace eights, uh, the you know the uh, the eight nines, the ten not the ten eights, uh, things like that. So this is one of those ones where the computer figures out that it has slightly reverse implied odds because you're going to be sharing cards and you're going to be sharing cards that make straights and second nut straights. So like if a guy has you know eight ten and you have the eight seven and the board comes off you know nine six five. Uh, 9657 or 965 jack or something like that you're gonna either be chopping or crushed so that's why it throws this out in real life in game you can add these in if the table seems a little bit snugger than it should be and typically at buy-ins less than hey boys hang on Getting the boys' collar. Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. Hey, Flip, how's it going? Looking uh, at preflop. Yeah, we're in the. Uh, hang on. This is gonna. This is gonna go away in just a minute when we get his bark collar on. Hang on. Okay. Um, it's going really good. Uh, this is. We're going over preflop ranges. This is the first section. Default ranges preflop. Seventy-five big blinds deep. This is a range of sixty to seventy-five big blinds. It's that small. Uh, basically, it's 60 plus. Anytime you have more than 60 blinds, that's where you're at. Um, and this is just opens. So if somebody limps, this doesn't apply. There's a reason. There, you do things differently when somebody opens. Uh, I think we know that six, seven, seven, eight, and eight, nine are no longer in open ranges, at least in true cash games. Well, first things first, we're not talking about cash games. And uh, <laughs> second thing first, you know, this is tournaments. Second thing first. Uh, those hands are absolutely in many opening ranges. Uh, six, seven, seven, eight, eight, nine, uh, especially suited. I will play those from many positions depending on the game. Um, and I would say I'm a little bit snugger uh, under the gun plus one. Eight, nine suited is not always in my opening range because typically when you have this many blinds, you're at the start of the tournament, right? So you kind of don't want to be, I mean, you can afford it. You can afford to be mixing it up a little. 
but you don't want to just bleed yourself down to the point where you're below 60 blinds and now you're playing on a different hand range while everybody else has a distinct advantage over you. That being said, when we're deeper in a tournament and I happen to be big stacked when I'm one of the top 10 players of like, let's say 200 players left, you know, which will happen, you know, daily, um, you know, just kind of the thing, the way some tournaments go. Uh, I absolutely open those hands from under the gun plus one, all like that. 10-9 suited is everywhere. Uh, everywhere that hand. Everywhere at every level with this many blinds, 10-9 suited is in there. That's one that I didn't used to know. 10-8 suited is almost as strong, but they give it to under the gun plus one. But then you see 9-8 suited is still in here. 9-8 suited remains all the way throughout. It's interesting. Why are you justifying not going with the chart Jonathan Little is showing? I'm not justifying it. Uh, I was uh, debating... Uh, with uh, uh, just for the holes, just for, uh, just for the lulls, why those charts are correct. There's adjustments. There's always adjustments. But this is my default. And the truth of the matter is, you have to have a default because the game's going to get so complex, you have to have a place to start. So um, definitely, uh, pretty much, I mean, the general philosophy is every hand is playable under the right conditions. There have been times I have three bet seven do suited uh you know from the button you know it, it just because i knew that the player wasn't going anywhere or, or wasn't going to uh, call me when i three bet him because there was a raise and a call and i three bet that one happened i think that happened actually on stream it was actually the classic seven deuce it was like one of the first streams i did uh play streams i pulled that off and it wasn't that hard i mean i got called by the original razor the flop came down my bet and i took it it's very simple <laughs> Uh, but it was a very specific situation where the cards literally had no meaning whatsoever. Uh, if I wanted to steal, all I had to do was do it and just realize the tempo of the game that was currently going on. And, you know, as long as you're not going to the will too much, you know, you can get away with it. Uh, so eventually players will fight back at you. Oh, damn it. I did the thing. Hang on. Uh, I clicked the wrong button. There it goes. I'm trying to find where I just clipped those charts. I think I'm gonna clip them again right now because I can't find it. Hang on. So when you see like mild discrepancies like that, you should probably just play the eight seven suited, but I'm giving you the perfect optimal charts, assuming your opponents play well, so that you can then adjust from those based on what your opponents likely do incorrectly. And I think you're probably gonna find most players are a little bit too passive and they don't three bet quite enough pre-flop. So if anything, you get to widen these ranges. That's a big one. Uh, players, especially at buy-ins less than $100 online, uh, are not three betting enough. You have to understand the, the factors of when to three bet are position, stack, cards. Like your cards matter the least when you're deciding what to three bet. Now, they make easier decisions. Like when you see aces, you're like, oh, this is a three bet, you know, saying stuff like that. But then again, when you're in the cutoff, you have 70 blinds, somebody opens, somebody raises, you can go, well, I can actually three bet here with, you know, king 10 offsuit because I have proper removal and I can play a squeeze. You know what I'm saying? Did you not grind yesterday? No, I ended up not playing yesterday. Um, I think I might have been just a little bit tired and I was kind of uh, working on some other stuff. God damn it, I did it again. Hang on a sec here. Hang on. I'm going to get this last time. Hang on before I answer your question. Just a touch. So from the low jack seat, that would be first position if you were six-handed, by the way. Um, some people ask, is there a difference between nine-handed poker? Um, so yeah, I didn't end up grinding yesterday. Today is definitely a play day. Uh, it's been too many days off for me. I didn't even get all the editing I wanted to do done. I think I just, uh, 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 I think I just needed the extra day off. I was, it was very, uh, uh, I was kind of muddled in my thinking, so I kind of let it go. Okay, where is this? Uh, I'm looking for the. Uh... Hang on, I can't find. Oh, there it is. Sorry, guys, I got to. Uh... Uh, I got to find this fucking chart. Hang on. Uh, da, 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 da. Files. Uh, desktop. There it is. All right, bring it out here. Why can't I see the goddamn icon? If the fucking file names are the same, why can't I see the fucking icon? All right, that's annoying. Sorry, whatever, I'll fix it later. 
<laughs> yeah, Eric actually won a tournament yesterday. Uh, it was, uh, it was. Uh, we talked about it off stream. It was pretty interesting. All right, let's get through this. I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll talk about the other stuff as it comes. Or ten-handed poker and six-handed poker, and the only difference is that well, low jack is now first to act. So basically, you would ignore these three charts because those seats are no longer at the table. So low jack would be first. This is what you would raise under the gun, six-handed roughly. And this is what you'd raise from the low jack seat. It's an important distinction, and especially when you're playing nine-handed tournaments and eight-handed tournaments, when somebody's missing from the table, when a, when a table's now seven-handed or whatever, you just throw out the under-the-gun range, and now everything moves up one range. So like he said, six-handed, you have the small blind and big blind, and you have the button cut off high jack and low jack. Low jack is now under the gun. So when you're six-handed, this is the range right here. If you are playing um, you know, with, with any number of players at the table. Just to be clear, we have the button, then to the right of the button is the cutoff, to the right of the cutoff is the hijack, to the right of the hijack is the low jack, right? So this is basically middle position. As we continue moving on over, you see we get to play wider and wider ranges. On the button, when playing deep stack, 75 big blinds deep, roughly, you get to play 54.8% of hands. This may be different than you are accustomed to. Some people play way tighter than this. Some people, however, play way looser than this. You'll find that some people will raise with any two cards on the button. But it turns out that's actually a substantial mistake if the players in the blinds play well. However, if you're on the button and the players in the blinds are generally tight, you actually should play wider than this, right? Remember, you always want to adjust to take advantage of what your opponents are doing incorrectly. So make sure you head over to pokercoaching.com, look in the tool section, get these ranges, and um, reference them. Because if you reference these charts enough while you are actually playing, you will eventually just kind of know which ranges you're supposed to use. Now to clarify, reference, not meaning before the hand, meaning act on your hand, then look at the chart and see if you were correct. Don't use these charts beforehand because then you are cheating and any poker site you're on, if they find out, they will absolutely ban you from their site. In various scenarios. And to be fair, like if you are under the gun and you happen to raise with, I don't know, Jack 9 suited or 9 8 suited, it's not a big deal. It's, if it does cost you any amount of money, it's going to be some tiny bit. If you're on the button and you fold the, uh, you know, 5 3 suited or the 10 3 suited, it's not a big deal. You're going to find that the hands that are on the very cusp of playability are usually barely profitable to begin with, but it is nice to have those hands in your range because it is going to generally make your. Um, bigger winning hands slightly more profitable because your opponents have to have to play a little bit more cautiously after the flop on all boards whenever you do play these weaker hands. For example, when you do raise from under the gun plus one, imagine you never played any of these like 10-9, 10-8, 9-8, jack-9, 10-9 suited hands. If the board does come 10-9-3, your opponent doesn't have to worry about you having those hands, which allows them to apply a lot more pressure to you. So you really do want to play roughly the hands in these charts without some sort of read that you should be adjusting based on your opponent's tendencies. Let's now discuss the unique situation of when everyone folds to you in the small blind. In this situation, you want to be playing a strategy that is very dependent on the big blinds strategy. Many players in the big blind will just fold every single time if you raise. Well, if that's the case, you should raise very, very frequently. When I say every single time, I don't mean every single time. I mean, uh, every time they don't have a very obviously strong hand. So against weak players, you just want to raise a ton from the small blind. However, some people will literally call you or re-raise you almost every single time you raise from the small blind. Against those players, you're going to want to tighten up a bit. However, this chart here is the optimal strategy from the small blind. And you see, it's a rather interesting strategy. It involves you just calling, limping, with some of the absolute best hands, some of these hands in the middle, and then some rather junky hands. And you may say, why in the world would we do this? Well, it turns out that when you limp with the absolute best hands, it allows you to limp with a wider range of junk. And when everyone folds you in the small blind, you would really rather just put in half a big blind and play a three big blind pot. Because remember, there's a small blind, the big blind, and the ante. So when you put in half a big blind to play a three big blind pot, you really don't have to win all that often at all to justify playing your hand. Okay, so then the raising strategy involves raising these hands at the top, which are generally pretty good, and raising these hands on the bottom, which are you know, acceptable but weaker. Also, when you do raise from the small blind, usually a 3.5 big blind raise is ideal when you are playing deep stacked, you know, 60 big blinds or more. And um, if you do stick to this chart, you will probably be perfectly fine. It is worth mentioning if you do limp with a, some of these best hands, you're going to be limping them and then re-raising them if your opponent raises. When you limp these hands kind of in the middle, you're limping and then calling if your opponent raises. 
And if you limp the hands on the bottom, meaning the junky hands like queen four offsuit, seven three suited, you're limping and then folding if your opponent right. He gets into that, and there's a completely five color, color coded chart that we'll see for small blind versus big blind specifically that he's going to get into later at every blind level. It's a super complicated chart, but you can kind of use your intuition at this point. This chart, uh, you know, you're going to limp aces, and if you get raised, you're obviously re raising. Um, and then hands like, you know, jack 10 suited, you're going to limp and call. And then hands like, you know, 9 5 suited, you're going to limp and fold. You know what I'm saying? So uh, there's a bunch of that in there with all this. And this is just when everybody folds to you in the small blind. Personally, especially at the beginning stages of a tournament, um, when I'm 75 big blinds deep, well, pretty much any time I'm that deep, uh, I'm going to be raising a much wider range of this because of the players that I'm playing against in general at the buy-ins I'm playing at. Now, after I've been on the table a few hours and we know how the blinds play and things like that and I haven't been moved in a while, you know, I'm going to veer back more to this standard, you know, play, but that includes the limp fold, limp raise, uh, you know, raise four bet, raise fold scenarios, you know, that I've got because I spent a good, I think it was about a good three and a half, four months uh, about six months ago uh really studying my small blind play like like it, it was over 90 days i remember I, I ticked it off as i went and just working on small blind versus big blind strategy at every blind level so i got a fairly good handle on it because like everybody else i realized the biggest leak in my game was losing from the small blind which everybody loses from the small blind it's just a factor of the position and what you have to play versus what you have to risk to win like you said, calling half a blind to win a three big blind pot heads up, you know, that's pretty much ideal in any scenario, you know, so you can play of super wide range. You know, we're playing, you know, 85 plus percent of hands here. Um, also, you'll notice there is no big blind chart. That's because if you're in the big blind and everyone folds to you, you just win the pot immediately. So there is no chart for that. So again, head over to pokercoaching.com and get these charts. You will find charts for all sorts of stack sizes, all sorts of scenarios and make sure you reference them because if you play the wrong ranges you're going to find that the errors you make before the flop generally compound after the flop and they result in you making bigger and bigger errors or having ranges that are just very very difficult to play and i want to make sure you don't have those problems and that you are playing well so follow charts and you'll be perfectly fine all right I'm going to do the quiz here. Playing 75 big blinds deep, everyone folds to in the low jack seat. With king nine off, you should. Uh, well, let's let's do it. Uh, I want to just pull up the charts, but for some reason, I'm losing the icon. Here we go. All right. So these are the charts. You can go to the tools section and generate them perfectly. But uh, we have 75 big blinds deep. The, the raise is going to be bigger. It's going to be 275. Usually three is fine. Um, and you are in the low jack seat, so let's just bring it up. You are in the low jack, looking at king nine off is a fold very easily. But it's good to realize how much you should be raising uh, in that scenario, but we're not raising it, so there you go. 75 big blinds deep, everyone folds you to you, and the cutoff was 7-5 suited. Well, let's go back to it. Cut off 7-5 suited is a raise, and your raises are only to 275. Bang. 75 big blind deeds, everyone folds to you on the button with 8-4 suited. Both players in the blinds are overly tight. I'm not even going to look it up because they gave it away. Overly tight. 275 every time. We can actually look it up on the button 8-4 suited. Do, 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 do. It's not in the range. You can see it's on the cusp. 8-5 suited is there. 7-4 suited is there. 8-4 suited is not there. But these players are overly tight, so this is an adjustment. That's why we're adding in this hand. So those are the little adjustments you can make in those scenarios. 75 deep, everyone folds to you in the cutoff with A6 off. Based on a live read, you can tell the player on the button likes his hand. Well, that's probably a good reason to fold. Uh, but let's look it up before we make the total decision. A6 off in the cutoff. Yeah, A6 is one of the is the worst ace in the deck. That's why I put it in there. Uh, A6 off is in the range. It's actually slightly in, and the uh, player Ace five or the Ace five off is in there too. Uh, these are kind of interesting because there's never any limps. I don't think. Um, 
and the player on the button is going to have position. So I believe it's a fold. I believe if you're on the button and the small blind player is prone to limping, uh, then you can just call the eight six off, but or the eight six off. But I don't think I would ever do it. So I'm going to go with a fold here. Yeah, you're at the bottom of your range. This player you have to act seems to like their hands, so tighten up your range and just let it go. All right, cool. Seventy-five big blinds deep. Everyone folds two in the small blind with seven three off. Player in the big blind plays well. Oh, well, all right. We're in the small blind. Player in the big blind plays well. Seven three off is a fold. Can I grab the keys? Just one second. I'm almost done with this. Okay. Uh, Seventy-five deep. Everyone folds two in the small blind with ten three suited. Player in the big blind usually plays a tight strategy. Well, I mean, that's a raise, usually. But 10-3 suited from the small blind. Where is it? Uh, it's a call, but the player plays a tight strategy. I'm going to go with it's a raise to 3.5. Small blind raises have to be bigger. There you go. And you're making it bigger because you want to price him out of calling. Uh, I don't think he said that, actually, in the lesson because he goes into it in... Uh, uh, in depth in the small blind play section, which comes up in a little bit here, but I can tell you through going through the course and through in-game practice, uh, if everybody folds you in the small blind you want to raise, make it three and a half blinds. And thank you. Uh, you're welcome. And the uh, that goes pretty much universally unless you're at the point of like the last two tables and everybody has twenty blinds, then you can make it three blinds. Or possibly two and a half if you have a stronger hand, like something like ace, king, ace, queen suited that you want to get in. Uh, but if you're going to open from the small blind, three and a half blinds is the meta. That's that's exactly what you do. Um, all right. I'm going to mark that as complete. We're going to move on to the next section. Now let's discuss the situation when you raise, when everyone folds to you, and then someone yet to act three bets you. That's when, let's say, you make it. 2.75 big blinds before the flop, then someone yet to act makes it nine big blinds before the flop. So let me give you two examples of how you should generally play in these scenarios. So let's say we're gonna get two spots. Under the gun plus two raises, that's you. And then the cutoff three bets you. And then- This is where the small blind stuff and the uh, big blind stuff gets a little complicated. Also so. under the gun plus two raises and then the big blind three bets you. So you see, both of our starting ranges are the same in these two charts, but the way we continue against our opponent's strategy is going to be very different. And it's primarily going to be based on position. Take a look at these two charts and let's observe the differences between them. It is worth mentioning that when you raise and the cutoff three bets, they're usually gonna use a smaller size than when the big blind three bets because the big blind is out of position. If they use the same size, when you are against the big blind, you would be continuing with a wider range. As your opponent uses a bigger re-raise size, you should fold more often. So let's take a look at these two charts, though, because we are going to see some patterns that reoccur over and over and over in this scenario. First things first, take a look at what percentage of your range you are for betting when you are going to be out. So to be clear, this first chart is you are under the gun plus two. You raise the cutoff three bets, okay? That's what this strategy is based on. The second chart, you're under the gun plus two. The uh, versus the big blind comes in for three bet, and it's a proper three bet, uh, meaning he's out of position, he's made the bet even bigger. This is how you respond uh, to that. Pumpkin seeds are out of the oven, hearing great pumpkin seeds everywhere. <laughs> At least they're down great from sunflower seeds. Yeah, I used to love pumpkin seeds as a kid, but they do make a big fucking mess. It's a big thing to cook those in Florida. Out of position, this is when you raise and then the cutoff three bets you, compared to when you raise and the big blind three bets you. So on the left-hand side, we are going to be out of position. On the right-hand side, we're going to be in position. Turns out you four bet a whole lot more when you are going to be out of position. That's because when you are out of position and you just call a three bet, very often you're going to check the flop, they're going to bet, you're going to have to fold. Good general rule, when you're out of position, you should be four betting more than when you're in position because of what he just said. But here's the other thing, a factor to remember. Let's say you have 60, 60 blinds and you open uh, ace king suited under the gun plus two. Okay, you open a two and a half. It goes around to the cutoff. The cutoff now makes it eight big blinds, right? And it folds back to you. 
the reason why you're now four betting for value with the ace king suited is because you're reducing the stack to pot ratio so when it gets back to you you're going to make it 30 big blinds and when you make it 30 big blinds if that player decides to jam you have an automatic decision to call because too much has been invested the pot is now too big it's not so much the investment but the fact of the pot size at that point facing that last jam if you both have 60 blinds you're going to have 30 blinds to call to win 120 big blinds total right plus the uh blinds and antis so 122.5 that's better uh than four to one on your money which means you only have to win <clears throat> uh uh what is it uh 20 uh, percent of the time and with ace king suited you are going to do that versus the deck uh except for precisely aces uh i think i think versus aces ace king suited is maybe if they're not counterfeiting uh, or well they would if they're not counterfeiting your suit with one of the aces on the king uh i think it's something like 17 percent, but that's close enough to 20 percent uh, I'll have to look that one up later, just for my own OCD. Um, weren't they by the door? Uh, if they're not there, they're probably uh, in your uh, room, the the den. Um, so that's the reason you're reducing the stack to pot ratio, making your decision simpler. Now, if you four bet under the gun plus two, and the player calls you in position, and you have thirty blinds left, there is now sixty in the pot. Uh, you can open rip with the ace king suited reasonably boards that you missed you know what i'm saying if the board comes off uh you know jack high you can rip that board quite a bit uh you can just go ahead and jam right into it and you're now representing the over pair and believe it or not you're actually going to be up be winning a large portion there where the other player has ace queen or they have a hand where they can't continue like pocket nines pocket tens things like that that have now missed the flop some players will even do it as low as pocket sevens uh, you know, I saw that like three days ago when I was playing and put a guy in that exact situation when I had aces and that's exactly how the betting went down. So that's the other benefit of four betting is you're reducing the size of the pot in relation to your stack, making it much simpler to play. But if you're in position, you get to stick around way more often on the flop. It turns out being in position is very valuable. When you are in position, you want to keep the pot small. And when you're out of position, you want to grow the size of the pot to take away your opponent's positional advantage to some extent. Okay, something else you'll notice. Both of these ranges are continuing eh, roughly 60-ish percent of the time. You're going to find that whenever you raise and someone three bets you, assuming they're playing well, you are going to want to continue with about 60% of your range. Something else worth noting, the hands that are folding are usually the big offsuit cards and kind of the junky suited hands. Um, but you see, we're really not continuing very often at all with the offsuit hands in either scenario. You see all the hands in green, there's almost no offsuit hands in green besides pretty good ones, right? Um, one more thing worth noting is that the bluffing range, the four bet bluffing range, is very polarized in both instances. And usually it's gonna be made up of hands containing an ace or a king very very important so you see in this instance even when we are only four betting aces for value we are also we're also using a few bluffs remember how i said you wanted to use a polarized strategy when your opponents play well and you want to keep them guessing this way if um under the gun plus two raises and big blind three bets when we four bet we have either aces which they are clearly in bad shape against or we have a few sporadic bluffs on the left hand side when we raise in the cutoff three bets we have again aces kings queens and ace king or a few sporadic bluffs when we do bluff with ace queen, we are actually bluffing with it. We are three betting, I'm sorry, we're four betting the ace queen with the idea that if they five bet us, we are going to fold. So um, realize that this may not look like a polarized strategy, but it pretty much is because it is one of the worst hands we are continuing with, or we could con potentially continue with. If we did decide to call with ace queen, we would use ace jack offsuit as a bluff instead. Okay? When he says stuff like that, if we did decide to, uh call with ace queen rather than turning it to a bluff we then would use ace jack as the bluff what he means is when you can make adjustments for being a little bit uh looser versus opponents if you're getting three bet too much you should be four, you should be calling the ace queen off like it's ace king off and then four bet bluffing the ace jack off 
because your hand has more intrinsic value versus a player who's three betting too much. That's a concept that took me a long time to understand and grasp and understand of exactly why he's saying what he's saying. And it might seem obvious to a lot of people, but personally, uh, I needed to clarify it uh, in my own mind. Uh, yeah, Wednesdays and Thursdays are super slow, uh, Eric. That's when I like to play most of the mega tournaments, the smaller buy-in with a lot of entries, like you know things where it takes you know a thousand players to get to the guarantee, because you're not going to get there, and you're going to be playing for an overlay. So uh, that's you know, and anytime you play a tournament and the poker site's putting in more money than than is in the prize pool uh, by actual buy-in, you're actually making money just by entering. It will certainly be an overlay in the nooner today, but the top prize is 5% less than yesterday. Yeah, yeah. It's also a day where you'll see a lot of people late enter uh, at large, uh, you know, at a greater frequency because of that fact is that things will get down to the last, you know, 20 minutes of re-entry and they'll be like, ooh, shit, I'm gambling here if I enter this, but the overlay is so big, it's, it's good money. It's actually not a great strategy to use, but you'll see players do that. Uh, they'll take the same disadvantage in chips because they think entering the tournament makes them money all the time when it's an overlay. The fact of the matter is, if you're only going to cash, you know, 5% of the time uh, in that scenario versus being there at the start of the tournament and cashing it 20% of the time, it's actually not a great strategy to use. But a lot of players do it. So uh, I would say if you want to play the tournament, play it. Uh, the prize pool might not be reached, but first prize will catch up because of the number of entries. Let's take a look at one more scenario where we are now in the cutoff raising and then either the button or the big blind three bets us. You'll see the same pattern holds true, right? Take a look at the uh, four betting strategy. On the left hand side, when we are going to be out of position, we're four betting a pretty good amount, 18%, right? On the right hand side, when we are going to be in position, we're four betting way less, only 8%. Notice that we are defending with about um, you know, 55, 60% of our range in both instances. Notice the four betting range in both instances is very polarized, right? It's becoming even more like obviously polarized to some extent. You see ace nine offsuit, king jack offsuit, low ace x suited, a few king x suited. And you'll also notice again the offsuit big card hands are folding to the three bet basically every time, whereas the suited connectors, small pairs, etc., are mostly calling. Okay? This is just the default strategy though when your opponent plays well. Let's discuss. Now, what happens if they don't play well? Well, you hear me say this a lot in this masterclass, you want to be adjusting to whatever your opponents do incorrectly. So against a very tight, straightforward player, you're actually gonna want to fold way more often because when you raise into three bet, they're just gonna have a really good hand. And if they have a really good hand, you need to get out of the way. For example, if um, we're in this situation where we raise the cutoff and the button three bets us, we should definitely not continue with hands like 10-8 suited, king seven suited, ace 10 off suit. 5-4 suited. These hands are all going to be in bad shape, and you should fold. So instead of continuing with about 55 or 60% of your hands, you may only continue with 35% of your hands. And that's okay because your opponent has a really good hand. Alternatively, if your opponent's a maniac, a maniac's a player who is raising, re-raising, and just generally putting you in bad spots, against a player like that, you're going to want to continue with a very large portion of your range. So in this instance, we would continue way more often, and we may actually 4-bet bluff him more, depending on... So it seems counterintuitive that a player who's not going to continue against you very often, you should be playing looser, but it's actually the opposite. Your range needs to be tighter because that player, when they play, they are going to have a better hand. So your range needs to be, you know, a lot more folds in here when you open and they three bet. You can't continue as much because their range is going to be stronger than your weakest part of your range. Whereas by contrast, if the player's a maniac and always three betting, well now your range can be even wider. So you can four bet bluff, you can continue more even out of position because you know the player's general range is weaker versus your perceived opening range, which is perfect GTO. On his overall strategy. So let's discuss a situation where we raise from the low jack seat to 2.75 big blinds with ace jack offsuit and then the button three bets to nine big blinds out of a 75 big blind effective stack. Against a tight player, we would always fold, literally every single time, because the tight player is going to have ace jack dominated. They're gonna have a hand that makes it to where we have only three outs a lot of the time. For example, if we have 
ace jack and they have pocket queens we're gonna need to get an ace and there's only three aces remaining in the deck it's not a good spot to be if we have ace jack and they have ace king we need to get one of the three jacks also not a good spot to be so a hand like ace jack is gonna be very dominated against a tight player however against the maniac someone who is three betting all sorts of stuff we should basically always continue with the ace jack because we are going to be in great shape we're going to be dominating them when they have ace nine off suit and ace four suited and jack seven suited and all sorts of marginal hands so against a maniac we're going to be continuing always either by calling or four betting but against a tight player we're going to fold pretty much every time against both players when we're playing 75 big blinds deep you're pretty much always going to want to call with the small and medium pocket pairs and you probably want to continue with the suited connectors against the maniac but you're going to want to fold them against the tight player and that's because we have to consider our implied odds. See, this is what we were talking about with the 9-8 suited, the 6-7 suited, things like that. And I was saying there are reasons why you continue with them, even versus 3-bets, is because versus Maniacs, the implied odds is through the roof, and you're going to see that here. So let's discuss implied odds really quick. When you are facing any raise, that can be when someone raises before you, when you raise someone 3-bets, when someone raises you 3-bet and 4-bets, anytime you're facing a raise, you want to figure out how much you have to risk compared to how much you can potentially win, not just immediately, but also on the later betting rounds, because more money will get bet after the flop. So let's say someone raises to 2.5 big blinds out of a 75 big blind effective stack. In this scenario, we have to call 2.5 big blinds to win a pot immediately of 7.5 big blinds, plus the 72.5 big blinds remaining in our opponent's stack. Now, he gets the 7.5 big blinds because of the raise of 2.5, our 2.5, and one for, the sm one for the big blind, half for the small blind, and one for the ante. So that's another 2.5. So it's 2.5 plus the blinds and ante's 2.5 plus our 2.5 means we win a pot of 7.5 immediately. That's where that comes from. He doesn't say that enough, but the blinds and ante's are 2.5 big blinds every time. And uh, you may say, how do we get 7.5 big blinds preflop? Well, it's our opponent's 2.5 big blind raise, our call, <laughs> plus the small blind and the big blind and the ante. So your implied odds are equal the amount remaining in the stacks plus the current pot that you will be calling into, that counts your call, divided by the amount you have to call. So let's plug in the numbers really quick. Take a second, do this on your end. We have 72.5, that's how much we can win on the later betting rounds, plus the total pot after we call, that's gonna be 7.5, divided by the amount we have to call, which is 2.5. So what we do now is we take this number, we solve it, and then we put it to one. So this will be a number to one. So it's gonna be 34 to one implied odds. And uh, this number, I'll, I'll let you know in just a second how to determine which hands you should continue with. Let's do one more example real quick to make sure you know how to do this math, because this is very important. Let's say you raise a 2.75 big blind. All right. Let's just do the math right away. Right away. So somebody raised 2.75 big blinds uh, to 12 big blinds of a 75 big blind effective stack. So that means that there is uh, the 75, uh, oh, sorry, duh, the uh, 63, so 75 minus 12, plus our 63 that would go in after it, plus uh, the bets and the calls, so another 24, uh, plus the blinds and annies, equals 152.75, divided by what we have to call, which is 275 minus the bet of 12.75, so it's 10.25. Your implied odds are 14 to 1 set mining and someone three bets to 12 big blinds out of their 75 big blind effective stack what are our applied odds well take a second think about it you're going to use the same exact equation as before nothing changes here except for the numbers are going to be different so take a second think about it solve it on your end now we have to put in 63 i'm sorry we can potentially win 63 big blinds more that's going to be 75 minus our the 12 big I doubled it. I was stupid. Uh, I did it wrong. The blinds our opponents already put in, plus the total pot after we call, which is going to be our opponents 12, our 12, small blind, big blind, and ante, so that's 26.5, divided by how much we have to call, which is 12 total minus our 2.75 we already have put in, which is 
we then solve that, and that will give us about 9.7 to 1 implied odds. Okay? It is worth mentioning, you will very often not fully realize your implied odds. For example, if someone's playing 300 big blinds deep and they raise the three big blinds before the flop, you're getting 100 to 1 implied odds or something like that. But you're not going to get all 100 to 1 implied odds because you're not going to win your opponent's whole stack every single time. In general, as stacks get shorter, you're going to realize your implied odds better. As your opponent is more maniacal and they're betting and raising and re-raising before and after the flop, you're going to realize your implied odds better. But you always figure your implied odds based on the fact that all the money will go in. So the idea is, for the, for the simplest idea, it's that pre-flop, you want to make sure the player has enough chips. So if somebody raises and you go to call, like you can see right here, 10, 10 to 1 is what you need with small players. So if you have a pair of fives on the button and somebody raises under the gun to 2.5 big blinds, if they have a 20 big blind stack uh, effective and you, had, you, know, you have more, it's not worth it to call because they don't have enough chips to pay you. They only have eight. They only have seventeen and a half blinds left. They don't have enough chips for it to make it worth it for all the times you miss. Now, if the person has at minimum twenty five blinds, so they started out the hand with twenty seven and a half, and they have twenty five behind, you calling that two point five big blinds is enough because when you hit their, your set and the money goes in, you are getting ten to one on your call. You're going to win at least twenty seven point five versus. Uh, the call preflop. Now it can be 25. It's fine, you know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that's the thing to consider. So you'll see, and this happens a lot in game. And I'll say, uh, well, I want to play this, but this player doesn't have enough money. That's what I'm talking about. When they don't have enough chips to make it worth it, I can't throw away the calls on these little pairs and suited connectors and bullshit hands that need more uh, need more potential behind them to win and that's the concept of implied odds like you can see with suited connectors you need the guy needs to have 20 to 1 so if somebody raised a 2.5 and you have 8 7 suited on the button you can call it if they have 50 fucking blinds but you can't call it if they have 30 because it's just not worth it you're not going to make enough versus the amount of times you're going to have to take that flop and fold if your opponent's a little bit more conservative you're going to realize your implied odds worse um, but in general if you are getting at least 10 to 1 implied odds with small pairs, you should pretty much always continue in the pot. And if you're getting 20 to 1 implied odds with suited connectors or suited aces, you should also pretty much always continue in the pot. If you're not quite getting the correct implied odds, you want to consider if your hand can continue based on its own merit, just because your hand's good. For example, uh, pocket ace is a hand that can, can, uh, can call a 3-bet, even if you're not quite getting 10 to 1 implied odds because you'll occasionally flop an over pair when the flop comes 7-3-2. You have a, a pair that's bigger than the board. Pocket 8s on 7-3-2 is pretty great. Even on something like 10-7-4, pocket 8s is still pretty good. So you're going to be calling 3 bets with hands like pocket 8s a large portion of the time. And you're going to find, if we go back to these charts, some of these hands that essentially demand implied odds but are not quite getting it, like 10-8 suited, 8-7 suited, 5-4 suited, pocket 4s, they are still going to continue even when they're not quite getting the required implied odds, but that's just because those hands are pretty strong. As the hands get weaker, like 9-6 suited, 7-5 suited, king-4 suited, these hands start to get folded. Okay? But the main takeaway from that is when you're getting 10-to-1 implied odds with the pairs, you basically always... Yeah, people do tend to overinflate their implied odds to justify the call. Uh, it really is something where you have to start being aware of the other player's stack and ask yourself, what can I win here? Um, and the easiest way I've always found to think about it is playing against, you know, the, 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 you know, old man coffees at the poker table playing one, two, and you're sitting there with, you know, eight, seven suited, you know, in the cutoff and old man coffee is sitting down with 80 bucks and he raises to six, you know what I'm saying? And you're sitting there with, you know, eight, nine suited or seven, eight suited or something like that. And you're like, okay, I can't even win enough off this fucking old man to, you know, to, to, uh, justify this call because one I have to hit the hand you know I have to get 20 to 1 immediately I don't even have that because he doesn't have enough left behind he, he only has 80 bucks he doesn't have 120 bucks uh, but on top of that he's also you know standard going to be fairly tight you know the older players you know at the bad one two the older players tend to play too tightly um, 
in general, most play too tightly at one, two, but, um, you know, in that same scenario, uh, if he's sitting there with $300, uh, and he makes that same raise, you want to call with the suited connectors and baby pairs every fucking time because, because they're so tight, they will get most of the money in with the aces. So you flop two pair or better, you know, you can just get all the money in on the flop a lot of times, believe it or not, versus these really, really tight players because one, they don't play enough hands. So when they do play, they get kind of overexcited. And two, they, they really don't want to get bluffed. So if you ever get in that situation and you like flop the joint versus aces, uh, you know, just like a trips or two pair or something like that, if they make their continuation bet and it's usually going to be sizable, just make a small raise back to them and you're going to see them go, you know, like either call it and then just you can make a monstrous bet on the turn and they'll just get the money in or they're just going to jam it all in right there. Uh, especially if there's like two of a suit on the board. But if it's like eight, eight, four and you have like, you know, eight, seven in your hand, but there's the two diamonds on the board, you're going to see them jam in so often it's disgusting. And then they're going to go, you got a flush draw. And the amount of times I've heard that where the guy goes, you got a flush draw after I call, I go, no, of course not. And I turn over the fucking trip eights. Then they look at me like I'm a fucking idiot. And it's like, I'm an asshole. Meanwhile, they have two outs versus me. It's fucking hilarious. It's the funniest shit that I that I ever come across at the poker table because of their lack of understanding of exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. It's hilarious. Is want to call. And when you're getting 20 to 1 implied odds with suited connectors and suited aces, you also pretty much always want to call because those hands when they do make a good hand after the flop, have the potential to win a lot of money. But you want to make sure you actually can win a lot of money. If you can only win a little bit, then it doesn't make sense to try to essentially make a strong hand because the amount you're risking now will not be made up for whenever you actually do hit your hand because you can't get paid off all that much if your opponent doesn't have very much money in their stack. So that's implied odds. Now let's discuss the, well, the reverse of implied odds. Those are reverse implied odds. So reverse implied odds is the idea that some hands are going to be extremely dominated, right? That's, again, when you only have three outs or maybe even less. These hands are quite bad, especially when we are deep stacked. And you're going to find that if we go back to these charts, the reverse implied odds hands are hands like king-10 offsuit, queen-9 offsuit, ace-7 offsuit. These hands can be played before the flop if everyone folds to you, but when you get re-raised, your opponent's range is going to have you incredibly dominated. So... You just have to fold these hands. These hands are not playable. A big mistake a lot of recreational players make is they'll raise a hand like queen-jack offsuit, someone will three bet, and then they'll call every time because, hey, they have two big cards, right? But in reality, you're going to be against a lot of hands like pocket aces, kings, queens, jacks. You're in bad shape against all that. Um, Ace-king, that's a head. Ace-queen, that's crushing you, right? Ace-jack, that's crushing you. King-queen, that's crushing you. Turns out you're just crushed a lot against a reasonable range. So it turns out hands like ace-x offsuit, uh, big card with a king, big card with a queen, these are just not good hands, and in basically all scenarios, they should be folded whenever someone raises before you, especially when you are playing deep stack, like we're discussing here, when we have more than 60 big blinds. My default used to be not to play the offsuited varieties because of their rever reverse implied odds, uh, but that's actually incorrect. You should be opening the queen-10 off and the king-10 off you know, from the... Uh, under the gun plus two position because of the removal your cards have. You just have to be aware that there's going to be a lot of hands in your range where you're going to open, get three bet, and fold. And it's an easy fold. And people kind of shy away from that concept because they're like, well, if I can't defend with this hand, what am I doing? Well, if you fold that hand, you're losing more value because when it, when you make that raise under the gun plus two with king-10 offsuit, let's say, and it folds around to the big blind and they call and the flop comes off and they check and you bet, you're going to win that fucker 90% of the time. Like, no matter what the board is, you can bet. And the fact of the matter is you're going to end up with some really disguised ones where you're going to, where the flop's going to come off, you know, 10-4-5, and you're going to have top pair with a damn good kicker, you know, the king kicker, and the big blind's going to have the 10 as well because they're going to be defending with a proper range. So they're going to have 10-9, 10-8, 10-jack, queen-10, all those hands, they're also going to have hands like, you know, the suited ace fives and fours that have a pair that won't fold, but you have them crushed and they only have very few outs. And they're doing that calling because they feel like you couldn't have hit the 10. You must have ace king. So they're going to go ahead and call you. And then on the turn, they're going to have to reevaluate when you bet again. 
Uh, so when the board pairs the turn, you got to be a little more, more aware when a five or a four comes off. But at the same time, if a card like a jack comes off, even though it seems bad for you, it's actually so good. And you can actually continue betting for value because the player is still going to be in their head going, this guy has fucking ace king. I have him crushed with ace five with a pair of fives. Uh, let's see. It's like the players who overbet pre-flop with aces because they're trying to protect. Meanwhile, they only win the blinds and Annie sometimes in their stacks so bad. The best example of that, Eric, I actually have a funny story. Uh, I was in a tournament, and this happened back-to-back -back hands. I swear to God. We were past the cash, and me and this other player were fairly big stacks. He was very tight, and I was me. Um, so this one hand happens. I'm in the big blind. And he's in the low jack. And it folds to him, and he's got 40 blinds. He makes it 15 blinds to go. And we're playing like 500 and 1,000 at this point in the tournament. And he did that, and I was like, uh, I think I was talking to the guy next to me. And everybody folds, of course, and it gets to me. And I go, and I look, and I go, did you bet 15,000? And he goes, yeah. And I go, jacks are good. And I, I open folded, you know, I think it was like I had something like 9-4 or something like that. And he goes, yeah, I hate this fucking hand. And he shows pocket jacks. And it's that's the hand that they freak out on the most. They always have that, there's no right way to play pocket jacks. Fuck you. I've never believed that. In my life, I've never believed there's no way to play pocket jack. Fuck your loser attitude. There's a way to play every hand. So the very next hand, as God is my witness, like, like a divine intervention came and I'm in the small blind with pocket jacks. Okay. I swear to God. And it folds to the same player, right? Uh, now he's a little earlier in position, and he makes a raise, a standard raise, okay? Uh, and I think it was like 2.2 .2 big blinds, something like that. It folds to me, and I 3-bet to 9 blinds. Goes back to him, he calls it, okay? I go, to, We go to the flop, it comes off 10-5-4. He waits for a second and then checks. And I kind of drum my fingers, actually I drum the nails on the side of the table so it was making this really cool clanking sound and I went same bet nine big blinds and he then raises and this guy you gotta remember we started with about 43 44 blinds a piece uh, so he's got like 36 left he goes I'm all in I go I snap call you sir and I go remember what you said about the pocket jacks there is a way to play them and I turn them over and he had uh, uh, ace 10 and I crushed him, and I eliminated him from the tournament, and I ended up winning that tournament. And he was like, oh. And somebody else said, you don't have to dig at him. And I'm like, no. This is the way you play pocket jacks. Well, if I'm him, I'm just... And he's still sitting there. I go, if I'm him, I make it 30 blinds preflop because I'm a pussy. And then you just fold. But now I got your stack. And he was mad, but I was like, fuck this guy. I was so tired of him. He was just a tight idiot who had been getting cards... And I was, I was salivating because I knew all I needed was one little bit of advantage against him and I was going to get him to make a huge mistake. And I did. I busted him literally the next hand. It was probably one of my favorite hands I've ever played because of what had just happened. Like it was one of those weird ones, like being blind versus blind and the guy chops all night and then doesn't chop and you have aces. That happened to me once too. But it's hilarious. But uh, th there is a way to play pocket jacks. There's a way to play every hand and that's why you do this, this work. If you are going to play these hands, they should very often be used as a bluff. Going back to this, you see hands like ace-jack offsuit. It's used as a four-bet bluff. King-jack offsuit uses a four-bet bluff, right? Ace-nine offsuit uses a four-bet bluff. And that's okay, but realize these are not calling hands. These are not hands that you want to call a preflop raise with, especially when you're out of position, especially when the stacks are very deep. Now, as stacks get shorter, Hands with reverse implied odds become a little bit more playable. And that's because very often they are just the best hand at the moment. And you can't really lose a whole lot more money because there's not a whole lot more money to bet. For example, if you're playing 25 big blinds deep, if someone, if you raise and someone three bets you and you have ace-jack offsuit, 
you're really not folding unless they're um, a very, very tight player, because if you make top pair, you're just happy getting your money in after the flop. But if you're playing 150 big blinds deep, if you make top pair with ace-jack and someone bets the flop and bets the turn and bets the river and wants to put all 150 big blinds in, that top pair is going to be pretty bad. So you always want to ask, essentially, like, what hand am I generally going to make after the flop? And if I make that hand, am I happy putting in a lot of money? And if the answer is no, I'm not happy putting in a lot of money, quite often you should just sidestep those situations to begin with, which is why when we go back up to these charts, you'll see the hands that call against the three bets are usually the hands that have the potential to flop very, very strong post-flop hands. Whereas the hands that are folding to the three better hands that are just generally weaker or hands that are very likely to be dominated and don't want to be put into a difficult spot after the flop. At this blind level, you gotta remember, like he said, like, you know, king 10 off, not great. But if you were to raise with it on the button and, you know, you got, you know, three bet by the big blind and you called it and you only had 20 blinds left, and the flop came off 10 high or king high, and you got all the money in on the flop, you're kind of happy, especially if it's 10 high. You're kind of good with that. I guess the better example is ace-jack, where if it comes off an ace on the flop, are you okay getting the getting all the money in where you have to call 20 big blinds to win 30, let's say, uh, or to win 50 total because of your 20, the other player's 20, and the 10 that's in the middle? You're probably happy with that, with ace-jack suited uh, with 20 blinds. But if you have, like he said, 100 blinds, uh, that pair of aces is kind of worthless if you get all the money in. But this also feeds into the bet, bet, bet strategy of when you can push players off hands. When you have more chips, you can three bet pre-flop, you can bet the flop, bet the turn, and jam the river with nothing. Just because of the, the perceived range that they have, a lot of players will call that turn bet and need to see you bet the river. Biggest mistake you can make is calling on the turn if there is a chance you're going to fold the river with your strongest hand that you're going to make. So if you've made, you know, top pair, you know, with ace jack, uh, you know, making top pair ace and somebody, you know, had three bet you preflop, they bet the flop, you call, you bet the turn or they bet the turn and you call it again. And now the river comes off and you, and they jam on you. It's amazing to me how often that gets a fold, but the person just continued on the turn with a hand that was too weak. They should, you should know when somebody bets the turn, they are going to bet the river. That's the assumption. If the player hasn't shown you any weakness by his bet size, timing, or whatever, the assumption is they're going to bet the river. So commit on the river. If that's the hand you got and you're going to call it and be left with you know a 0.5 stack to pot ratio, you probably just want to get it in or fold, man. You got to make the decision right there. Uh, and if you're going to get it in, you don't have to jam. You can just call and allow them to bluff, and then call it off on the river. That way you guarantee to realize your odds. I think people float the flop wide in three-bet pots and fold a ton uh, to a double barrel. That's very true. The The current, it used to be that when you see bet the flop, people would fold about 65, 70% of the time. Uh, but you're saying they float the turn? I'm saying they float the flop a lot. Unfold on a turn to a double barrel. Oh, yeah, I skipped the word turn because double barrel means the turn bet. Uh, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, and, but now people know that everybody everybody C bets. So when you play a hand, yeah, no, I got it. Flo f sorry, flop, float, fold, turn. Uh, now a lot of people know they should still be calling on the flop, especially in position. Uh, the fact of the matter is you can be a much better player by understanding that your hand isn't just a three bet preflop and a C bet it's a three bet preflop a C bet and if it gets called it's a turn barrel unless the board is just amazingly bad for you that's probably what you're going to want to have in your head when you three bet especially near the top of your range ace queen suited in plus you know or pocket jacks in plus obviously if an ace comes off that's a different story if you have pocket jacks but a lot of times you'll see you know, this with ace-queen suited and the, the board will come off nothing and I'm just betting the flop and betting the turn and then getting the fold. And depending on what the board texture is, I will jam the river usually a very high percentage of the time, uh, probably about 60-70% of the time because uh, I'm not going to bet through the turn if I don't believe I'm going to get the fold on the river. But I understand that I must bet the turn to get the fold on the river. Oh, there's my alarm. Sorry. 
I set an alarm so I wouldn't be the morning stream too long because I want to play in the afternoon. We're going to finish this section and then I'm going to wrap it up. FYI, entry plus rebuy, uh, uh, ace queen off, 18th and shifts, attorney with 85 players. Right. Right. Oh, and the add on. Right. So at the end of registration, this is what we were talking about on WSOP because of their structures. I would just typically wait standard to right to the last minute of, of re entry and then enter, take the rebuy and the add on. And now, like you said, you're 18th in chips in a tourney with 85 players. And you were able to take the first hour and a half off. You know, fuck them. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I used to do. That's why I love that, uh, that strategy for WSOP. And some tournaments are like that. Meanwhile, there's tournaments on ACR that have six or seven levels of late reg left that I won't even enter because I know that, you know, I can't add, I can't inflate my stack right from the start. I have to win from there. So it just depends on di your different stack sizes and strategies. All right, let's finish this up. So again, the, the uh, set of charts I gave you here are just default charts, but I really don't think you need to be heavily relying on the default charts in these scenarios because you will have reads on your opponents. Some people are going to play way too tightly, in which case you should fold way more often when they three bet you. And some people are going to play way more wildly, in which case you should continue way more often. But that said, you do want to understand that against a generic opponent, you're going to want to continue with about 55 to 60% of your range. When you're in position, you want to be calling way more than when you are out of position. When you're out of position, you want to be four betting with a wider portion of your range. So those are some basic... So understand what he said there. In position, you're going to be defending the same amount of times. The same amount, you're going to be defending about 55% when you open and get three bet. In position, you're going to be calling more out of position you're going to be four betting more so that means the hands that you want to four bet are either bluffs or value hands but you're not going to call as much because of your positional disadvantage basic tips um, and we'll continue moving forward all right this we're going to have to use the tools section because i didn't i didn't snapshot these but uh we'll, we'll get there uh okay so i'm going to bring up the tools section just bring up another tab with Jonathan Little's uh, poker coaching site in it. And I'm going to show you guys how I do this uh, in practice away from the game. So go to the tournament preflop pre GTO charts. And the question is, you raised a 275 out of your 75 big blind stack. Okay, so we start with 75 big blinds. We'll call it 80. That's fine. Uh, from the cutoff. Okay. Oh, we have the chart right here, but I'm going to do this one to look at. Uh, a strong player three bets the button to 12 big blinds. Can you profitably call with 3-3? Three, three? Well, let's just use these. Fuck it. 275 out of 675 big blind stack. Uh, a player with 3-3. Three, three. A strong player on the button three bets to 12 big blinds. Can you profitably call? Well, what we're looking for is our implied odds, right? So we're going to get out the calculator. And our implied odds are... There's a shortcut here. You can just do the player's whole stack, 75 blinds, uh, plus uh, what you're going to put into call. So that's, uh, what is it, uh, 9.25 equals 84.25 divided by uh, your call right now. Uh, so that's, uh, oh, wait a minute. So it's do, 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 do. his whole stack plus my whole call, which is 12 big blinds. Right, that's right, 87, uh, divided by the immediate call of 9.25 blinds. Uh, well, plus the blinds in any, so I guess it was 89.5. So 89.5 divided by 9.25. We need 10 to one. Don't have it. And he's a strong player, so we got to give it up. Need 9 to 1 to break even. Right, but we're not trying to break even. So we want 10 to 1. You know what I'm saying? You're not you're not trying to break even. We we want 10 to 1. So that that's why we go the extra unit. So we have to call. Right. You should fold. This hand is not a profitable call. It was 9.6 to 1 and we decided not to take it. Because he doesn't have enough money. He needs to have 10% more in his stack for us to call. So, 80 big blinds. 
eh, 85, somewhere in there. See what I'm saying? And it seems like a small thing, but it's really not. It's You're, you're giving up way too much. Because remember, you are risking 12 big blinds total, an additional 9.25 now. That's kind of big out of your 75 big blind stack. So the payoff has to be worth it. You raise 2.75 big blinds out of your 80 big blind stack with ace-10 suited from the cutoff. Uh, yeah, you quickly jump to the answer. That's that's why, see, that's why away from the table, that's why you need a calculator, that's why you need Equilab, that's why you need your charts. When you go over things away from the table, you can then find the true answer, like we did, and then in game, you don't have to think about it. You just go, oh, dude, this cost me eight big blinds to call, and this guy's only got 60 blinds. I can't call. And you just fucking chuck it away. You know what I'm saying? Uh, let's see here. Raise 2.75 out of your 80 big blind stack with ace 10 suited from the cutoff. Cool. A strong player in the small blind, three bets you to 7.5 big blinds. Can you profitably call? Well, I know the answer, but let's go ahead and do the math uh, just so we can get there. So, there's an 80 big blind stack. Uh, he three bets very small to uh, 7.5 big blinds. So our implied odds are, let's go with his whole stack plus the 275 we already have in there uh, plus the big blind and antes because remember, he's in the small blind. It's been absorbed by his raise. So that's an additional two blinds, one for the big blind, one for the antes. 8475, and it costs us... Uh, what is that? 4.75 blinds to call divided by 4.75. We are getting 17.84 to 1. Uh, he is a strong player. And as you can see, the ace 10 suited. Uh, let's see here. He was in the uh, small blind. Uh, so we're going to go with uh, from the cutoff, big blind. Okay, this is the, the 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 pay is a little bit better because he's in the small blind, not the big blind. So we have the free big blind money. So the ace ten suited, we absolutely continue with. We call. We're getting seventeen, almost eighteen to one, uh, on the call for implied odds. But also our hand defends better, and we are in position. So the answer here is yes. Ta da! This is a profitable call due to the small size of the opponent's three bet and the fact he gets to play in position. Now, if he had made it a proper three bet, which from the small blind there would have been about. 10 or 11 blinds, we fold all day. The section seems to not only be talking about with you dealing with shorter stacks, but how to leverage the small stacks when it's yours. Very true, because you do have to consider that. Now you gotta remember, in these scenarios, the effective stack is a deep stack. So you get the side benefit of understanding that when you're shorter, these numbers change. But what we're talking about primarily in here are when you're deep stack versus the opponent. Opponent, When, you know, it's 80 big blinds, he says, out of your 80 big blind of stack. That means you're the effective stack. That means the other player has at least as much as you. You know what I'm saying? If he said, you know, the player raised 275 uh, out of his 40 big blind effective stack, you could have 500 blinds, but if the other player has 40, that's what we're going with. But this is primarily deep stack, but you're right. This does show you how you can leverage shorter stacks based on how much money you have. So let's say I'm on the button, right? And I have 40 blinds and a player raises and I three bet him and he has a uh, hundred big blinds, right? But he looks at his hand and he has pocket eights. He kind of can't continue, be or sorry, pocket fives. He kind of can't continue because he needs to hit a set. You know what I'm saying? So I don't have enough to validate that call for him. So when I make it nine big blinds, or eight big blinds, whatever, and he goes to call, he, he should realize, wait a minute, these pocket fives are no good because this guy needs to have 80 blinds in his stack for this to be profitable. If I just call here, I'm pissing money away. It seems like you just need 5% equity on 19 to 1. Um, yeah, don't get too much into that. The I was figuring the pot odds as part of an exercise in that hand. I was figuring the implied odds with the ace 10 suited, but that's really not the factor. The real factor is the small blind or the small raise that he made and the fact that he's in the small blind out of position to us. Having ace 10 suited is very strong and you can see here, that's why I just had to find it on the chart. That's how we get to the answer. Uh, 
20 to 1 is what you need. Yeah, so you, you got it, right? Right, that's what I'm saying. I want You always want to figure it out and make it a... It's kind of like, you know, it's like any other muscle. You got to work out and get stronger. So if you can figure out what you need for implied odds on every hand, cool. But understand, ace-10 suited is not a hand where implied odds become a factor. It becomes the strength of your hand. You know what I'm saying? Because you're going to make a pair of aces, you're going to make a pair of tens, you're going to make straights, you're going to make flushes, it's true. But if you make two pair with ace-10, right, that's when your implied odds come in. But the strength of your hand on its own stands up. So... You know, if you make an ace on the flop, you're not just going to fold when this guy c-bets, right? You're going to call it, and then if the turn, if he c-bets properly, well, then maybe you can get away from it, unless you hit a 10. But if the guy has pocket kings, right, is he going to barrel three times into you when there's an ace on the fucking board? No. He's either going to check the flop, which is usually what I do, and then go for value on turn and river, unless I'm shown strength, or he's going to c-bet the flop, because he's going to be like, well, if the guy doesn't have an ace, he can't call. Then he's going to see that you called and be like, shit. Check. And then you check the turn. The river comes off and he'll check again. And then you can go for value. And depending on how stubborn or silly he is, he'll either call it or fold it. Some runouts we might need to fold, uh, might need to fold top type hands in certain runouts. Very true. In certain runouts. But it also depends on the betting structure and the perceived range. True, when a player three bets from the small blind, they're gonna have a, a fairly good range. If they bet, if they see bet, if they three bet small, most of the time that's a stronger hand. Then you're getting into like because they want to get played with. That's queens plus. You know what I'm saying? You'll see this a lot at lower tournaments. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't adjust the size of your raise to your hand strength, ever, ever. I don't give a fuck. You know what I'm saying? You never do it because you're giving away too much information. But even in that scenario, I'm still calling with the ace-10 suited because the immediate value that I'm getting versus the call is well good enough. And if somebody has aces, kings, queens, I'm going to know very quickly on the flop if I want to continue. If I hit an ace, then I have to figure it out. How often am I going to have an ace, there's an ace on the board, and the other guy's going to have a pair of aces? Well, combinatrix, we can go back to that. There's only one combination of pocket aces. So that's out. We just discount that. Can he have ace-king? Sure. But a lot of players, even on a short stack especially, they're going to re-raise bigger to reduce the stack to pot ratio. Cool. So we don't have to worry about that too much. What's more likely? Kings, queens, jacks. Those are the hands. They wanted to race it pre-flop. You did not allow them because your hand didn't merit it. You have ace-10. But now there's an ace on the flop. Now they're fucked. You know what I'm saying? So... That's the situation you find yourself in. Uh, so yeah, it depends on some runouts, but it also depends on the betting structure through the hand. The runout, I find, is not as important as the other player's betting. Because the runout is going to be there anyway, and when you start thinking about the runout too much, you start seeing monsters under the bed. You start going, oh, he could have this, he could have that. When logically, it's not true. You know what I'm saying? In that betting scenario, if we raise, get three bets small from the small blind, and the flop comes out 4-4-5, four, four, and the player bets, or it comes out 4-4-ace, four, four, right? And the player bets, and we call. Uh, and the turn comes off a 10, right? So now it's 4-4-ace-10, four, four, and we have top two pair, aces and tens. And the player bets again. Your brain should not say this player could have a four. Your brain should not do that, okay? This happens especially when there's a backdoor flush draw and it comes in on the river. You should not be worried about that based on this betting structure because that's not what the player's trying to do. You know what I'm saying? So let's say, let's go through the whole hand. You have ace-10 suited on the cutoff. Small blind, three bets to, to 7.5. The flop comes off 4-4 four, four, ace. He bets a, a third pot. You call with your ace-10. The turn comes off a 10. The player bets again, two-thirds pot now. You call. The river comes off. It's a fucking five, whatever, okay? He now jams all in. Are you ever folding here? If you are, jump off a bridge because you have top two pair in a situation where you are almost guaranteed to be up against ace-king, and you have drawn out on that on the turn. You now have aces and tens. He has aces and fours with a king. You should never be sitting there thinking, he could have ace-four. 
He could have pocket fives. He could have pocket tens. He could have pocket aces. He could have deuce tray. You know, he could have a straight. You know, like you shouldn't be thinking that shit. If you're thinking that shit, it, you, you need to stop because you're just leveling yourself into seeing monsters under the bed. And here's the thing. Very rarely, you're going to be in the situation where the guy did flop aces full. Very rarely. And when that happens, you can just sit there and go, bad beat, man, on to the next one. That's truly a bad beat. A bad beat is not getting it all in pre-flop, aces versus kings, and the guy hits a king. That's not a bad beat. A bad beat is one where you should be convinced you have the absolute best hand when all the cards come out, and a random small percentage thing happened where you just so happen to not have it. You know what I'm saying? Because the hands are so close in equities. So that's the thing. And leveling yourself will cost you years on your poker development. You have to throw out the illogical stuff and get, in, get comfortable with the concept of the conceivable nuts. The most reasonable hand that is best. Not the pure nuts. The pure nuts is quad fours on that board we ran out. But if by some miracle you had pocket tens and hit the ten on the turn, you have the conceivable nuts. You know what I'm saying? Even ace four. You could have opened ace four suited, flopped the full house. The other guy could have pocket aces, yeah. He could make pocket tens full on the turn, yeah. That is a thing that happens in the world. But like Einstein said, probability, not possibility, is what matters. How probable is it? It's not very. So you should be more than happy to get the money in with ace four full house at any point in this hand and just be like, well, that sucked, you know, and just move on. That's why you'll see me laugh. Somebody mentioned it in uh, in the stream the other day that I took a bad beat. It was like a two outer. And uh, I was just like, I started laughing and somebody whispered me and they said, uh, what, how can you laugh about it? And I told him, you ever watch Jackass and you see the guys get hit in the nuts or fall off of something and they're in immense pain? You know they're in immense pain, but they're just laughing. Laughter reduces pain. So when you realize how, rid how ridiculous something is, it's actually proven that laughter can reduce your pain. So those guys would laugh to reduce the pain. If you talk to, if, and Johnny Knoxville did an, did an interview later, he actually said that laughing about the situation helped him when he was dealing with pain. Steve O did a whole thing about it. It was really interesting. So if it's that painful, man, just realize it's ridiculous and just laugh about it. Aces versus your full house. They flop top full, you have second full. Fuck the world, man. That's too funny. Last question. You raised 2.75 blinds out of your 60 big blind stack with 9-8 from the low jack. A strong player three bets to 75, 7.5 big blinds. Should we continue? This is one where implied odds come in. I already know the answer, but I'm going to illustrate it for you. Okay? 60 big blinds is the effective stack. We're just going to count that as, our, as the implied odds of our opponent. Plus our 2.75 that is already in the middle. Plus the blinds and... Or is he in the... Buttons. So plus the blinds and annies, 2.5, equals 65 blinds. It's going to cost us an additional 4.75 to call, okay? Because there's 275 out there. He raised to 7.5. It calls us four, costs us 4.25, okay? We divide by 4.25. We are getting 15 to 1 on a call with 9.8 suited from the low jack. Versus a strong player. Nope. Not enough. We need 20 to 1. It seems nitpicky, but we need 20 to 1 to do it. Wrong. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't go to the chart. I fucked up. I was thinking about just the call. He's right. We're in position. I fucked that one up. This, If the positions were reversed and we had opened and they three bet and were out of position, then my math is correct. That's when we call. I read the question, question too quickly. From the low jack, strong player from the button. He's in position. We're out of position. We should call it uh, uh, the three bet with the suited connector spot due to your implied odds versus the deep stack. Yeah, because, because he's in position. We're out of position. We should be calling more instead of folding or four betting. Stupid thing I, I, I just confused there. But this is why I go through these quizzes, man. The dyslexia switched the question around on me. So there you go. 
So 15, 15 to 1 is definitely good enough when we're just going to check or fold the flop. I was thinking about four betting uh, in position versus calling out of position. So that's fine. We're going to mark this as complete. And uh, go back to the... Uh, go back to the courses. Hang on. Go back to the courses. We'll go to the tournament master class. And uh, see, we're into the uh, 60 big blinds. So that took us... Here's how dense this thing is. I've been streaming for an hour and a half. We're two sections into this first section. This is only pre-flop 60 big blinds plus. We still have all this to go. The next section, pre-flop 35 to 60 big blinds. That's how specific you have to get. Worst bad beat I ever saw was Gabe Kaplan, who talked himself into one by not properly understanding what was happening at the final table of a 100K buy-in tourney that had 82 entries, the third biggest tourney in Las Vegas that year. Uh, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one actually, I don't think it was on TV, but it was written up somewhere uh, and put all over town. Yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Because Gabe was doing good. Uh, uh, he was doing really good. And uh, he fucking tanked it. Was that the year uh, the one drop first started? No. This, oh, you were the reporter. Okay, yeah. So you wrote the thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. No, that was way before the one drop. Uh, way before that was like that hundred K buy-in was when was that Eric? Was that like the late nineties? Cause that was, that was early in poker. Hundred K's did not come around. It, it might've been in the two thousands, but I feel like it was in the early nineties. You were the only reporter. So yeah, you must've written it up and that's must've been what I saw. Cause I've heard that one. It was, it was something like he had like two pair versus uh, a set or something like that. Uh, I forget the exact thing. You can tell the story, man. Or was it set over set? I forget. No, that was the year of the second one drop. It was a satellite. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So that must have been like 06? No, it could have been earlier than that. Remember watching it on TV? Yeah, I don't think it was on TV though. The one drop was on TV, but I don't think this particular event was. It was a satellite to the uh, the one drop. So 100 uh, 2013. Uh, well, it's possible. So 100K buy in to get into a million dollar tournament. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, and then you're sitting there with a 100K buy in uh 82 player field. Fucking, what is that? That's $8.2 million? Jesus. That's crazy. All right, I'm going to close this stuff out. Uh, I'm not going to do a host. Uh, Spraggy's on. Go check him out. Uh, I'm not going to bother. Let's see. The first was uh, Sam Trickett. Yeah, yeah, against Antonio. Yeah. Antonio coming out. Love Sam Trickett. Ended up being the pocket nines hitting a set versus King King versus Ace Ace, and Kaplan had the biggest stack with 10 10. Oh, yeah. That's one of those things. Hang on one second here, guys. What the fuck is this? Why is Sprint texting me? Um, all right. I don't even have Sprint anymore. <laughs> all right, guys. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. I'm going to uh, stream. I'm probably going to be playing at about 3 o'clock. Uh, I'd say 3.30 at the latest. Uh, I'll post it in the title. So if you want to come back and check, I'll let you know what time in a little bit. Yeah, at 3.30 I'm playing uh, at the latest. Probably 3 o'clock I'm going to get started. Maybe worth a million in prize money. Yeah, definitely. All right, I'll see you guys later. i got to go eat and uh, do some things and get prepared. And uh, we're going to come back for the grind at about uh, 3, 3.30, somewhere in there. I'll see you guys later.